Ladies and gentlemen, Jerry Lewis. When you turn on your tube every Labor Day, you expect to see Jerry Lewis. For 24 hours, there would be Jerry and the sweet silver sound of Lady <laughs> Telethon, Jerry Lewis, Telethon, Labor Day. Jerry Lewis Telethon This week on Week on This was a thing Jerry Lewis Telethon this week on this was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> was a thing, pretty much Atari, Deep Throat Roots and Ted Bundy, Hanoi Jane, Celebrity Bowling, that was a thing, Bobby Fischer, Blackouts, Benny Hill and Paul, Lynn and Dolly and Marie, Rich Little and Billie Jean King, this was a thing. Hi, I'm Ray. And I'm Rob. And you're listening to This Was a Thing, the podcast that dives deep into the cultural happenings of yesteryear. On today's episode, we are looking at the Jerry Lewis Telethon. Ladies! <laughs> oh, this was a thing because it created what we know today as the Telethon, as well as originating the template for what a televised fundraiser should and should not do. From 1966 to 2010, the MDA Telethon, or as we really know it, the Jerry Lewis Telethon, uh. was an annual Labor Day marathon that raised money for children affected by muscular dystrophy. And for 24 hours, the star of stage and screen, Mr. Jerry Lewis, cried, yelled, screamed, shunned, embarrassed, and inspired countless children and adults into donating to a cause that some of the beneficiaries actually wanted nothing to do with. More on those naysayers a little bit later. Wow. Are you, Mr. Hebel, a Jerry Lewis fan? I can't say I'm a fan. I feel like I've seen one of his films when I was younger, and I was like, okay, I I can see why people like him. It was The Family Jewels. I don't know if you know that one. I've watched a couple documentaries on the man. I've seen more documentaries on Jerry Lewis than actual films of Jerry Lewis. <laughs> that... Well, I, that makes a lot of sense to me. And today, we're going to be focusing a lot on Jerry Lewis, the man. Now, I'm going to be very upfront about all of this, and I'm so sorry if I offend anybody. I am not a huge Jerry Lewis fan. What? I do not find him funny. I find that his arrogance as a human being supersedes all all of his comedy. But what about his old stuff? I This is just me. Him falling down and acting like a child, to me, is not the funniest thing that I've ever seen in my life. Obviously, there's a lot of people who are going to disagree with me, and that's okay. A child falling down's more funny. Absolutely. <laughs> and I'm sure Jerry Lewis would push his own child to the floor to get a laugh, and we'll talk more about that a little bit oh boy. <laughs> later on, right? So, we're going back now, folks, to the Jerry Lewis telethon. Well, any telethon should be about those who benefit from the proceeds. And... In full disclosure, this telethon brought in about $2.5 billion oh, wow. when all was said and done. The Jerry Lewis telethon was really always about one person, whether it was intentional or not, <laughs> Jerry Lewis. Today, Jerry Lewis is probably best remembered for his unrelenting arrogance and his manic physical comedy, which really hasn't aged too well, in my opinion. But he was a genius. He said so himself. Hold on. So I just Do you, do you like Jerry Lewis? <laughs> I'm on the fence. The French, the French loved Jerry Lewis. They worshipped at his altar a comedian. Garçon! Act Garçon! <laughs> 
Actually, a comedian once said the reason the French love Jerry Lewis is because they don't get the telephone. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of true. So in order to understand the magnitude of the tele- <laughs> telethon, you have to understand the magnitude of Jerry Lewis as well as his split personality. There are really two Jerrys. There's Good Jerry, right? Good Jerry was the Jerry Lewis the public knew from his movies, which was this childlike goofball and such things as the Nutty Professor and is the brilliant typewriter pantomime from Who's Minding the Store. And I will admit, that is brilliant. Here we go. This is a clip of Good Jerry. If you're going to do an impression, you know the best one, like when I was nine, you know why? I, I, I love to watch TV a lot when Gilligan's Island was on, and I would see that, and then you know what else? I love, I love Lucy, and she used to fool around like she and, and uh, Desi Arnaz never I, I, <laughs> really did it, and I love, I love that. Bad Jerry, or as Martin Short called him, Lozenge Jerry, (laughs) Bad Jerry was the arrogant, vain, self-glorifying, everything I do is brilliant and I know it, Jerry, (laughs) that would appear on talk shows and throughout most of the telethon, especially as the evenings would wear on and it was clear he might be tired but also a little inebriated or under some prescription medications. Here's a little clip of Bad Jerry. Just so you can get a sense of what we're talking about. Why was Nutty Professor? Why did it work? Why was it your most famous movie? Because I wanted very much to write the absolute best comedy approach to a classic. Robert Louis Stevenson wasn't bad. (laughs) Jekyll and Hyde wasn't bad. It's a wonderful place to start from. And I always thought in terms of the light side and the dark side of comedy. And that's what inspired my writing. The telethon really allowed Lewis to become the definition of the schmaltzy, maudlin, and superior celebrity that bought into their own hype, much like you, Ray. Amen. But how did he get that hype in the first place? Let's go back to the Jerry Lewis origin story. So from the 1940s to the 1960s, Jerry Lewis was probably the most popular comic of his day. A 10th grade dropout, he immediately found work in comedy clubs in vaudeville by lip syncing to popular records. He also would have been brilliant, I'm sure, on RuPaul. In 1945, Lewis's career changes when he meets a singer by the name of Dean Martin. And the first words he utters to Dean are, so you working? And the two hit it off and they form an act. It's hard to explain now, but the act that they had, Martin and Lewis, was revolutionary for its time because unlike other comics at this time they both can sing brilliantly they're both very attractive and they ad lib off of one another with ease and nobody had ever seen that before everything always had felt very scripted and structured so the whole event feels spontaneous you don't know what martin and lewis are going to do next especially lewis this act led to their own radio show and then they were rotating hosts on a tv show called the colgate comedy hour colgate comedy hour which brought them into the living rooms of the viewer, and the viewer could now see the zaniness that was involved. It cannot be stressed enough how much the world worshipped at the altar of these two men and how their comedy and their ease with one another fascinated the world. So Paramount obviously comes around, and they start to do Martin and Lewis movies, like my friend Irma, At War with the Army, and about 14 others. But it's really clear that Jerry is really the star, and Dean Martin is just sort of there. I totally, wholeheartedly disagree with this. I think that Dean Martin is absolutely brilliant. He's great support. He does not get the credit that he deserves. And I don't think Jerry Lewis would have been as successful if he did not have such a great partner. He's a good straight man. He's a good straight man. Just like you, Ray. Thanks. So while the telethon would later be known as the Jerry Lewis telethon, it's important to remember that it was actually Dean Martin who was with Jerry in the early days of the telethon. And not just the MDA telethon, but telethons in general, which were a really new concept in the early days of television. They think the first telethon was in 1948 and was hosted by Milton Berle, Mr. Television. Now, this telethon was only shown in New York City. It lasted 24 hours, and it raised about $100,000 for the Damon Runyon Foundation. Oh. And the concept for the telethon would be that entertainers would come out and sing for long periods of time, once again, televised, and you at home could donate via mail, or they wanted you to come down to the studio to drop off money or a check. Wow. The Damon Runyon Foundation's idea inspires the Muscular Dystrophy Association. In 1950, the Muscular Dystrophy Association was created with the mission of informing the public about neuromuscular diseases, which really wasn't talked about at this time. If you had a neuromuscular disease, you were looked at as something as an other. 
and families would be ashamed and kids wouldn't go to school about it. And so it was a very different time. And thank God we've progressed. And I'm sure that the telethon had a lot to do with that. Money that would be raised would not only be able to help doctors look for a cure, but it would also go to the educational and day-to-day living assistance of those with such diseases. To get money, they decide, the MDA, to do their own telethon on a network called WNEW, which is only shown in New York City. And Martin and Lewis agree to appear on the first telethon. And subsequently, there's other MDA TV programs that are launched in other cities, but it's really the New York one that's only hosted by Martin and Lewis that people seem to be interested in. Throughout the early 50s, Martin and Lewis, they continue to do more benefits and TV appearances, all trying to bring attention to the MDA. At the same time this is happening, as Martin's roles in the films become less important over time, and Jerry Lewis is receiving like the majority of critical acclaim, there's a tenseness in the partnership. And it comes to a head when Look Magazine publishes a publicity film photo of Martin and Lewis and cuts Martin out of the photograph. Wow. On June 29th and 30th, 1956, Martin and Lewis then hosted another MDAA telethon called the Martin and Lewis Roundup live from Carnegie Hall. But this time, Lewis and Martin wanted to make it more professional and see if they could make it feel a little glossier. So they got an, a Hollywood film crew out there. Oh, wow. And they paid for it out of their own dime. Oh, nice. So they were very, very passionate about finding a cure for muscular dystrophy. Less than a month after this telethon, shockwaves are sent throughout the industry because Martin and Lewis split. What? I know. I'm so sorry you had to find out this way. No one knows why, and they never talked about it. Jerry once said that Dean had told him, to me, you're nothing but a fucking dollar sign. But it's clear, I think, that Lewis thought he was great, as everyone said he was. And I'm sure that arrogance was just a little annoying to Dean Martin. Wow. And so Martin goes off, obviously, to have an amazing singing career and does the Rat Pack, the Dean Martin Variety Hour, the Dean Martin Roasts. Roasts. If you're a big fan of those, which I'm sure we'll cover those at some oh, point on this show. Oh, those are going to be covered. And Jerry Lewis continues, you know, acting and writing and directing. He wants to show how versatile he is. Auteur. An auteur. An auteur. An auteur, I'm an auteur coming down to stay <laughs> Lewis then continues to host the telethons on his own, and they now are on Thanksgiving, 1957, 1958, 1959. By the mid-1960s, though, the success of these telethons convinced MDA to stage a 19-hour telethon to support MDA's New York efforts. Lewis was going to host the, the big event, and this time, this is, this is genius, folks, instead of saying, hey, you have to come down, we're going to set up phone banks. Okay. And you can call in to donate, and we're going to put the people answering the phones on camera. So now when you see telethons and people are on the phone, sure, right, that all comes from the MDA telethon. The only time the MDA can get any sort of studio for cheap is during Labor Day. Okay. Now, Labor Day, especially in New York, everyone's out of town. So, so the network is like, who the hell's going to watch this? In fact, the network didn't even want to give them the license to do the show because they're like, this is just a waste of everybody's time. Wow. But they're going to surprise you. On September 4th and 5th, 1966, live from New York City's Americana Hotel, currently a Starbucks and H&R Block, <laughs> welcome to WNEW's MDA Telethon. They built Jerry a talk show set. They gave him a 19-piece band. And one of my favorite things, because it's now a staple of all telethons, the tote board. The tote board comes out of the MDA telethon. The station was like, they're not going to raise anything. So they put only six numbers on the tote board. <laughs> And they made a million dollars. Oh, wow. So Jerry Lewis grabbed black paint and painted a one in front of the tote board. Now, in 1967, Jerry is going to have a new friend with him that's not Dean Martin to help him out on the telethon. Who's that? It's here's Eddie. Ed McMahon. Eddie from the Munsters? No. Oh. Um, ba -da 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 -dum, da -da -dum. oh, okay. I cannot stress how important Ed is to the telethon. So while Jerry got to show off and be maudlin, Ed introduced guests, calculated donations in his head, took over hosting duties when Jerry caught the occasional 20-minute cat nap, and Jerry was unpredictable, especially after the first few hours on the air. So Ed had to be prepared to jump in at any moment to sort of like rescue the broadcast if Lewis fucked up. In 1968, they're finally able to do a live broadcast to stations outside of the New York City area, Buffalo, Rochester, Boston, and New Bedford. Now, these four other cities that are going to broadcast the telethon, they become what are known as the love 
Network. Ooh, and the, the Love, Love Network. Network. The Love Network is a network, the networks that are willing to air the telethon. Love it. Right? Love it. Now, the idea was that the telethon would only stop when local stations had to identify themselves. Like, you're watching WNAW, Rochester. But Rochester broke away and was like, hey, everyone, look at the locals we have answering the phones. And Rochester took in more money than any other station because they were breaking away showing the locals. So each year, they now will have local cutaways to show everyone in your area working to raise money for MDA. So if you see a cutaway on a telethon to your hometown, thanks, Jerry Lewis. In 1970, this show had, I need a drum roll, please. It's first Coast to coast broadcast with 64 stations, including Los Angeles and San Francisco, making $5 million for the MDA. And all the unions, actors unions and stuff, told all their performers, listen, you can go perform for free. They don't have to pay you because it's a telethon. And because that hindrance was removed, Jerry Lewis had all of his famous friends come on the telethon. Sammy, Frank, Charo. And then in 1973, folks, we get the telethon as we know it today because there was 150 Love Network affiliates. That huge number meant that Lewis could go glitzy. They're not going to do it in New York anymore. Guess where they're going? Vegas, baby, at the Sahara Hotel. And now it really is the Jerry Lewis telethon. How does Lewis explain MDA and its beneficiaries on national television to a national audience for the first time? Well... Just like this. I think the man upstairs goofed. He made a mistake. And I think he put people like Ed, myself, and all these lovely people at the celebrity phones here to repair that goof. If you remember during the war, the rubber company said, well, recap it. I think the man upstairs wants us to fix something he did not know he did. So once again, Jerry Lewis is saying that people with muscular dystrophy are God's goofs, and he has been sent by God to fix it. Let me explain what you see when you sit down on Labor Day, hopefully high as a kite, to watch the Jerry Lewis Telethon. For most of its run, the Telethon ran live for 21 and a half hours, ending at 6.30 Eastern Time on Labor Day Monday. Now, you have to remember, folks, there's no YouTube, there's no DVR. Some people don't even have VCR players. And for 21 and a half hours, you're getting to see every big star in one place and it's literally free entertainment the opening number was always a great big toe tapper it was the same opening number (laughs) the entire time and what number was that charlie chaplin's smile now smile the title sounds optimistic but when you think of the lyrics smile even though your heart is aching smile even though it's breaking so it's literally the most depressing morose wow thing you've ever seen in your life thanks uncle jerry then we went to the opening credits and hey let's hear some of the big name guests jerry would get for his show starring jet allen bob anderson terry austin billy party elise beasley sam Barron, lee benton shelly berman the barasini orangutan Elaine boozler george burns Lance Burton, Leo Bascaglia, Shirley Caesar, Charlie Callis, George Carl, Carter and Chanel, Jennifer Chandler, Petula Clark, Denise Clemente, Bart Connor, Danny Cooksey, Norm Crosby. And that's just the C's, folks. <laughs> you like the orangutans, didn't you? The Ray? orangutans were so good. Then there'd be a production number or a monologue. Jerry would come out, he'd talk, he'd play MC, he'd kibitz with the audience. And there was just lots and lots of clips of kids with MD suffering and really discussing how mda had helped them followed up by a jerry bit well jerry jerry would interview the kids now i will say this uh, and i have not heard anything different he was apparently incredibly kind to all of the kids not just on air but off air as well like one kid i know wanted to go bowling with him and so he flew out to chicago to go bowling with the kid oh wow so apparently apparently as much of an asshole as he was to everybody else, to these children, he treated them with nothing but respect and kindness. As long as a kid's last name wasn't Lewis, he was very kind to them. Oh, God, ain't that the truth? So then after he would talk to the kids, he'd introduce his own family and their family dog. My feeling is this is probably the only time the actual family was in the room with him throughout the, at any point during the year. I'm sure the conversation that preceded that was, I want to introduce the dog. 
Jerry, uh, if you're going to introduce the dog, you're going to have to introduce the rest of the family. I'll be more than happy to introduce the rest of the dog's family. <laughs> no, no, Jerry, your family. <laughs> Celebrities galore would come on from all areas to perform. They would beg people to donate and uh, show us that entertainment that was not cynical, sarcastic, or pest- pessimistic. It was a very optimistic affair. And then, of course, the locals would always come on and bow down to King Jerry. During the show, Ed McMahon always tried to guess the final tally, and he was usually pretty close but this stopped in 1982 because they were short by two million (laughs) so they had to stop but the big reason people would tune in i think or if you had a sadistic side to you was what jerry said which was people watch the show to see if i'm gonna make it and what people were really waiting for was to see would jerry get loopy from his lack of sleep yeah make it whatever drinking and drugs he had done and how maudlin sometimes confrontational or bizarre he would get watching nighttime Jerry at two o'clock in the morning battle his way through to get to dawn again. And of course, like Ray had mentioned earlier, the one thing you always looked forward to was at the end of every telethon, Jerry going on no sleep, drunk, drugged, (laughs) and sweaty, would sing the song of hope and optimism from Rodgers and Hammerstein's Carousel, You'll Never Walk Alone. Here's an example of Jerry singing You'll Never Walk Alone in the early days of the telethon. Walk on, walk on, with hope in your heart, and you'll never, never walk alone, you'll never. So for a guy who's going on no sleep, he still sounds pretty good, though. He's a pro. Hey, friends. Hope you're enjoying the show. If you are, could you do us a favor? After you listen to today's episode, open up your podcast app and leave us a review. Please. The more reviews we get, the more people will discover us. And the more people that discover us, the less lost we'll feel. You're good, buddy. It's okay. Uh, uh, look, nothing has ever been easier to do. Just go ahead and grab a pen real quick. It's okay. We'll wait. Don't worry. Okay. Head on over to your podcast app. Click those three dots in the lower right-hand corner. Click Go to Show. Scroll down till you see ratings and reviews, then leave us some stars and a comment or two so our parents know that it was worth all the tuition that they spent. And if you really love us, head on over to Patreon.com and send us some money, and in return, you will get access to merch, special episodes, bonus content, pictures of me shirtless. Okay, okay, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. Search This Was a Thing and help us out. But you know what? You've already helped us out today by listening to us, and we can't tell you how much we appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you. There were some iconic moments that happened throughout the telethon's history, but because there was no YouTube, you'd have to call everyone to say, turn on Jerry Lewis and say, what in God's name is happening? You would call your friends at two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning and be like, you have to see what's going on. So these are just a couple of highlights for you. And we're going to go in chronological order. Joan Crawford, Mommy Dearest, in 1968, she comes on to the Jerry Lewis telethon and it's clear she's very intoxicated. Joan decides that she wants to read a poem. The poem is called The Clumsy Falling Down Kid. The clumsy child was a figure of fun, fumbling his shoelaces, tripping when he'd run. He didn't jump much and fell when he did. We smiled and said, oh, what a clumsy kid. The falling down child wasn't funny when he'd struggle to walk and then fall again. And the best he could do was a clumsy crawl. That's when we hardly smiled at all. The motionless child rested where he lay, muscles quite useless and wasted away. And we stood 
awkwardly by and cried as gracefully at last the child just died. We all died with him a bit, or should. The child had done the best he could with muscular dystrophy. Ponderous, ponderous name for a clumsy, falling down, helpless lame, for trying but dying all the same. One of my favorites is the great actress, Lainey Kazan. If you don't know Lady Kazan, she's the mom for my big fat Greek wedding. She was in one of my favorite movies, You Don't Mess With the Zohan. She's the one who has the affair with Adam Sandler. She's a brilliant actress. And she came on to perform Barry Manilow's Copacabana, which is a very fun, innocuous song. But let Meisner acting student, Lainey Kazan, get her hands oh, on it. no. Here's Lainey's version of Copacabana. years ago when they used to have a show now it's a disco but not for Lola she's still in the dress she used to I just want to say this audience when we were getting set up we, Rob said, "Oh no, you, I just I just need you to hear the audio. You don't need to see the video clips." Can I tell you how much of a travesty it would have been for me? So, ladies and gentlemen, please go and look up these these video clips because you have to All see All on the link, folks. All Lainey the- Kazan's take on Copacabana. Holy shit. <laughs> Click on the info description, folks. You can get these links. Now, the one thing that the telethon was probably known for in terms of performing was 1976. So Frank Sinatra always was on the Jerry Lewis telethons, but he always did them remotely. In 1976, he actually says to Jerry, he goes, no, I want to appear live with you. And the fact that he was appearing live with Jerry Lewis was Big news. So everyone tunes into the telethon to see Jerry and Frank live. So automatically people are watching it. And Frank comes out. He does his set, right? And he presents Jerry with a couple of donations, including one for $5,000 on behalf of his grandchildren. And he says to Jerry, listen, I have a friend who really loves what you do every year and who just wanted to come out. (gasps) Could you send my friend out, please? I bet I know who it is. Who is it? Dean Martin. And out walks Dean Martin Uh, to a minute-long standing ovation. Everyone in America went crazy. Everybody started calling each other saying, get on, we're going to have to turn on the TV. Can I tell you, as much as, as annoying as Jerry Lewis is, I bet that probably was such a moment, though. Like, for for the two of I don't know just for the two of them like for like Americans to like or that are watching going like holy shit Martin and Lewis are back together yeah oh of course like of it course. just that would have been like one of those moments you know like a t- if it was nowadays it would have been so tweeted about oh or, absolutely you know like that kind of thing is absolutely what I mean. and the two you have to remember Jerry and Dean did not speak to each other for twenty years and I mean when I say they didn't speak literally had no contact with each other for twenty years until Frank Sinatra arranged this reunion. Dean's surprise appearance caught Jerry completely off guard. And the first thing that Jerry says to Dean Martin is, you son of a bitch. And then he looks at Frank and says, should have been a Jew that did that (laughs) to bring them back together. And Frank is like, I'm going to go over here now. So it's just Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin with everyone in America watching them. No script. And Jerry just looks at him and says, so how you been? You working? Which is the first thing he ever said to Dean Martin. I don't know. How you been? You know, it seems like uh, we We haven't seen each other uh, for 20 years. (laughs) Well, you know, there was all those rumors about our breaking up, and then when I started the show and you weren't here, I believed it. I'll show you guys to your room if you like. The lights are out upstairs, so follow me. Oh, he drinks a lot, this kid. 
Uh, so you're working? <laughs> so now many MD patients and their parents were very proud. The money was going to the right places. And Lewis often funded things out of his own pocket and oversaw everything with this amazing detail. But then the 90s rolls around, the very politically correct 90s. And the public starts to turn on the telethon because it's, it starts to feel that you're portraying people with MD as pathetic, helpless creatures, and the telethon is not about really empowering them. And in 1990, Jerry Lewis doesn't really help matters any. This is uh, from an interview on Primetime Live about an article he wrote where he imagined he was stricken with muscular dystrophy. Oh, what a great idea. Lewis wrote about cripples and said if he had MD, he'd have to learn how to be half a person. You called them half a person. You've talked about the indignity of being carried. You've talked about the steel imprisonment. I wrote that in a piece, Of yes. the wheelchair. Right. All of that. You right. Wrote. Is that the way you really feel about it? They can't run with me down the hall, can they? Well, no, Jerry. No, they can't. No. In 1992, ABC's Primetime Live with Chris Wallace runs a special called Jerry's Orphans. And Jerry's Orphans is an organization of people that have muscular dystrophy and other neurological diseases. Uh, its founder was a gentleman by the name of Mike Irvin. And these are all adults that have this that are not happy with Jerry Lewis or the telethon. They say Lewis succeeds by portraying them as objects of pity, reinforcing stereotypes of the disabled as helpless and childlike. I think that he is the personification of what we call the disability bigot, which is the guy who thinks that we are something other than human. Wow. Right. And now many of Jerry's orphans staged protests outside the studios during the telethons. But there were tons with MD who supported Lewis, and Lewis had no intention of apologizing or changing his ways or being ashamed of what he did create. Here's Jerry Lewis from the same interview. In our interview, Lewis confronted Jerry's orphans in detail for the first time. They've got a problem. I hope that they get better. Well, how can you say that? I mean, they, How can I say it? Listen they, again. They have a problem. I hope they get better. But these people have this disease, and they say you're making them feel childlike. I feel terrible about that. It's a shame. But while I'm playing to 100 million people that think what I'm doing is okay, I can't worry about or dignify 20, 30 people. I can't. I haven't got the time for that. Here you are. You've devoted most of your life right. to this. Now, here you have former poster children, mm -hmm. kids that you you hugged that was sending to college and they are now turning on you and calling themselves jerry's orphans forget the issue personally what does that do to you why didn't they call us anything when we bought them the wheelchairs chris why wasn't i a terrible man when we bought them the wheelchairs that are getting them around don't you know that all of the people that have nothing to do with them are appalled by what they're doing Jeez. So it's hard to support a telethon when those receiving money are not wanting to be involved. <laughs> but if you give folks a good show, they can overlook that. And that is really where the telethon starts Will to suffer. Will Lainey Kazan be on this episode she, this year? La Lainey, come on in. As time went on, the comedy is stuck in the 60s with like Borscht Belt humor. And the performers throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and forward is always Tony Orlando, Norm Crosby, Charo. <laughs> So you have the people receiving the money being angry that they don't that they're the way they're being portrayed. You then have comedy that doesn't seem to be keeping up with the times, but more often than not, the problem seems to be that Jerry just keeps putting his foot in his mouth. Jerry's opinions didn't really evolve as the times did. Here's Jerry talking about female comedians. I cannot sit and watch a lady diminish her qualities to the lowest common denominator. I just can't do that. Jerry, who are your favorite female comedians? My favorite female comedian was Cary Grant. <laughs> <laughs> In 2001, talking about the idea that pity is used during the MDA telethon, he says, if it's pity, we'll get some money. I'm just giving you the facts. Pity? You don't want to be pitied because you're a cripple in a wheelchair. Stay in your house. <laughs> but don't worry. He comes from my people, too. Here he is <laughs> talking about gay people. 
Look how good he moves that camera over here. Son of a gun. Wherever I go, he goes. Let's see what you do with this over here. Oh, your family has come to see you. You remember Bart, your older son? Jesse, the illiterate fag. No. If you could not hear, in that clip, he called the cameraman's son a fag. The gay community is incredibly upset about it. I remember it. when this happened. And Jerry apologizes profusely. I never use that type of language. If you know who I am and who I interact with, you know that I'm not homophobic. And a year later, Jerry is in Australia, and they say to him, Jerry, do you play cricket? And he says, no, it's a fags game. And then finally, folks, here is the wonderful Jerry Lewis on refugees. And what do you think about the refugees? Allowing refugees these refugees... Refugees should stay where the hell they are. They say there's a humanitarian crisis. They're fleeing. They have to come to hey, America. Hey, nobody has worked Europe. harder for the human condition than I have. But they're not part of the human condition if 11 guys in that group of 10,000 are ISIS. This is unreal. Right? And then in 1999, something is obviously happening to Jerry Lewis. He suffers from meningitis, and he gets very, very tired. He's older, it makes sense, and he decides he'll only do five hours up front and five hours at the end, and the rest of the time you're not going to see him at all. Now, as time is going on, they keep losing the big love channels that don't want to be associated with it anymore. The audiences are dipping away, and the donations keep di dipping. So finally, in 2011, MDA decides that the 2011 telethon will now just be six hours. And I think Jerry somewhat knows this because when he sings You'll Never Walk Alone Again, he knows he's singing it for the last time. Here's Jerry Lewis's last, You'll Never Walk Alone. Grab your Kleenexes, folks. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high and don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of the storm is a golden sky and this Sweet silver snow of a lark. <laughs> and he just breaks down and cries. Jerry knows it's time to end. Jesus, Jerry. Now, here's where it starts to get even more bizarre, if at all possible. The MDA also announces, unbeknownst to Jerry, apparently, that this will be his last broadcast as the host. And it's going to be co-hosted from in the future with So You Think You Can Dance as Nigel Lithgow Ooh. and The Biggest Losers, Alice and Sweeney. And Lewis, <laughs> in reply, said, So You Think You Can Dance feature contestants who were, quote, McDonald's Wipeouts and Sweeney's The Biggest Loser, a series which Lewis claimed was about contestants, quote, knocking their brains out trying to see how we beat the fat lady at 375 pounds and in four months she's going to be 240. Who cares? It's ridiculous. MDA doesn't like him shitting on them and their new hosts. So he they say he's no longer the chairman of the MDA and that he's not the 2011 host. And the hosting duties will be split now between Lithgow, Sweeney, Entertainment Tonight's Nancy O'Dell, and Jan Carl. Nancy O'Dell. Right? Now, celebrities come to Lewis's defense. How could the MDA get rid of someone who is so instrumental in giving them so much money but Honestly, what really is happening, the MDA says off the record, is the fear, it seems, was his cognitive ability. Sure. And fear of what he might say that would do more harm to MDA. And, of course, once he leaves the telethon, obviously, it's a Jerry Lewis telethon. You can call it MDA. Yeah, you can yeah. call it, it's a Jerry Lewis tel telethon. It's like, it's like how New Year's Rock and Eve is always going to be Dick, Dick Clark. Clark. Yeah, Dick Clark's it's Rock Dick and Clark. Eve. Absolutely. And so this, it starts to fail miserably because Lewis is gone and because the, the way the MDA treated him publicly. So now the show goes from six hours to three hours. They renamed it Show of Strength, and it's mostly pre recorded. So it kind of loses all of its spontaneity and fun. Wow. ABC takes it on in 2013, and they say, we'll only give you two hours. And then 2015, MDA is like, you know, telethons are outdated. So peace out. MDA stops doing the telephones. And in 2016, Lewis does a video for them. Obviously, they've made some amends that they post on their website. And he's just like, please give them money. And then he died, Jerry Lewis, in 2017 at the age of 91 years old. And after all that Jerry did for kids that he never even met, this was his own son's reaction to Jerry's passing. 
When Jerry Lewis died earlier this year, it didn't take long for the news to break that all five of his surviving sons would be disinherited. They would not be left a penny of the estimated $50 million estate. Jerry's son, Anthony, spoke to our Victoria Racano. I knew I wasn't going to get anything, but the real sticking point, the dagger in my heart, is for the grandchildren. Lewis's sons were from... Even to the end. Jerry Lewis was a total asshole. Who did he leave the money to? His new wife and new daughter. Wow. So even though we think that MDA is totally gone, in 2020, Kevin Hart brought it back, literally on a social media platform, and it raised some money. But at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, it will always be Jerry Lewis's show. When we come back, we will talk more about Jerry Lewis, the Jerry Lewis telethon. And were the Jerry's orphans right or wrong in protesting the Jerry Lewis telethon? We'll be right back. This was a thing, this was a thing. And now, this is a sketch. Happy Labor Day to you. Thank you for calling the MDA Telethon. What's your donation? Where's Jerry? Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Mr. Lewis is no longer hosting the show, but all donations are going to the same charity that they always have, the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Okay, well, first off, I'm not a lady. Uh, second, wh- wh- what did you do with Jerry? Why- where are you hiding him? He's always been there for me year after year. Yes, uh, sir, I understand how you could be upset, but please know that all of us here are still working toward the same goal, and that's to completely rid the world of muscular dystrophy once and for all. Yeah, yeah, I get it. But Jerry was the face. You're never going to get any money with with Nancy Odell. Who the hell is Nancy Odell? Does she have any catchphrases? Oh, I'd love to hear Nancy Odell say, Lady! Nancy was the host of Entertainment Tonight for many, many years. Again, sir, what's your donation, please? Many people are trying to get through. Yeah, probably to ask what Jerry is. It's very confusing. Well, sir, it's something that had to be done. The show needed to evolve. Yeah, oh, I watched it evolve. Jerry used to be a, a fun-loving guy, but then he turned into a real serious guy. But that's life, you know, human beings. Are an interesting bunch. Yes, uh, sure. Uh, Mr. Lewis evolved, sir. Sure. Um, w- would it make you feel any better if I told you that his final evolution was into Nancy O'Dell? You no, know, that would help. Look, I labor all year for one day, Labor Day. I-, I like to feel celebrated for my work, okay? And I do all that laboring to watch one thing on Labor Day the Mr. Jerry Lewis Labor Day Marathon. Telethon. It's a telethon, sir. Exactly. I'm telling you that I want Jerry back. Jerry, who the hell are you talking to? A lady! Hello? Hello? Thank you. This was a sketch. Welcome back. So, as much as I am not a huge fan of Jerry Lewis as a person, I will say that even though there is a a complaint nowadays of exploitation of these individuals... One of the things that's important to remember is that there were no persons with disabilities being portrayed in the media at this time. Sure. And so to see not only people that have had disabilities and to get a human story behind them, I think probably went a long way in giving them visibility and reducing the shunning that they had had previously. Yeah. All right. And people finally began to understood what was muscular dystrophy, what were neurological disorders, and that can you have some humanity and sympathy behind it? Also, positively, it created the telethon sure, or the fundraiser. And anytime now there's a major disaster or an election, we see tons of fundraisers that happen on television or now online. They're all using what the MDA and Jerry Lewis created. What do you think the response would be today? to a Jerry Lewis telethon. I mean, if you got the right celebrity to do it, and I mean, if a celebrity was willing to give up 24 hours of their time, I mean, I think it could be, if it was for a worthy cause on something, I mean, especially on YouTube, YouTube now is a platform that could do something like this very easily. And I feel like it would be a lot easier than getting affiliates and getting local, you know, people, if you just go onto YouTube and go ahead and go to this link, there'll be a 24-hour marathon. And what do you think about the idea that the overall tone of these fundraisers was you were supposed to pity these individuals and it was not emboldening or celebrating these individuals. Yeah, that definitely would not happen nowadays because the world just does so much to include, I mean, have inclusivity and everything and showing that, you know, a person with disabilities 
are, are just like us, you know, like they may have, you know, some struggles, but, you know, they're perfectly capable of doing a lot of the same things we are. You probably didn't see as many people like even in a wheelchair working in an office setting back in the day. You know what I mean? Like, sure. Do you think the telethon had something to do with that? I truly think that his heart was in the good place, but he still had Bad Jerry taking over even when he had a good heart. Yeah. You know what I mean, Bad Jerry could still have a good heart for certain things like this, but still heart overtook brain when it came to this. Agreed. And I think today one of the issues people will probably have with a telethon like this is the fact that it's being hosted by somebody that doesn't have muscular dystrophy. Yeah. It's not an accurate representation. I feel like this is just such an anomaly when it comes to other things, the Jerry Lewis telethon, because there's so much and there's so many years to draw from with the same people. Sure, there could have been, maybe there's a telethon 10 years in a row, but probably nowadays you wouldn't probably have the same host 10 years in a row. They you would, spice, I mean? it they up, would yeah. spice it up and then there would also be different takes. I'm sure, you know, like how an Oscars has different producers totally. and stuff. They would bring in a different set of producers with, you know, whoever's hosting to work with their, like you said, flavor. So, hey, so. So, anyway, we talked about the Jerry Lewis telethon. It was a thing because it really defined what a telethon can do, what it shouldn't do, and became a Labor Day tradition for so many. And a big thanks to Jerry Lewis for. His heart on this was in the good place. And it actually was kind of nice because it actually showed he had a heart. Maybe he thought he could be an asshole 364 days out of the year because this was the one day that he would redeem this himself. This is the last day of the year I can wear white. <laughs> and I have to enjoy it. I think I choked on the lozenge. Hey, you want to play a game? Yes. This was a thing and now it's a quiz. This is a This Was a Quiz. With Mark Schroeder. Wow, the Jerry Lewis telethon. I, I'm going to go on record and say one of the biggest jerks I've ever seen, Mr. Jerry Lewis. I'm not a fan of him, nor was I. Uh, <laughs> this episode, I'm sure, underlined some yeah. things for you. And yeah. how are you today, Mark? Uh, <laughs> I came in with an agenda. But I think we can all agree Jerry Lewis, really shitty person. Yes, did yes. a really did a good thing with the Muscular Dystrophy yes. Association. Okay, so that got me thinking. What are some other? Who are some other really terrible people through okay. history who have done one good thing? Okay, so <laughs> sure. This game, I'm going to give you the one good thing, and then I'm going to list four arguably terrible people. Okay. One of which did this good thing. Oh, okay. okay? So okay. I'm going to give you the good deed. You tell me which horrible person did it in a game that I'm calling, yeah, but they're still terrible people. <laughs> okay, I like <laughs> this that. This is great. Now, do, are we playing against each other or, or are we playing together? You go, we'll be together on this oh, one as hey, well. Oh, yeah. hey, collaboration. Hi, how are you? Ray Hebel. Hey, Rob Schneider. Nice to meet good you. Good to meet you. All right, and here we go. Question one. This person once worked at a suicide hotline. Was it A... Jim Jones, B, Ted Bundy, C, Marilyn Manson, D, Bill Cosby. One of them worked for a suicide hotline? I want to say it's Jim Jones. I wanted to say Marilyn Manson. Yeah, but I mean, I feel like he would just tell people to rip their ribs out so they could suck their own dick. Is that true? Did he really do but that? But that gives him a purpose. Yeah, that's gives true. you a purpose in life. <laughs> so maybe it is Marilyn Manson. Uh, who did you want to say? You want to say Jim Jones? I think I want to say Jim Jones. I don't know. I just feel like it's a suicide hotline. Mm -hmm. I could be totally wrong. I feel like those came yeah, probably later. later, but I, I don't know. No, 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 no. Jim Jones. Jim sure, Jones. Jim Jones. The answer is B, Ted Bundy. Oh! Ted, Bundy. Ted Bundy worked at a Don't suicide Don't kill yourself so hotline. I can do it. <laughs> Don't do it. You've got, you got such to live for <laughs> like now, tonight at 9 p.m. <laughs> Question two. This person opened free soup kitchens for the poor. A, Mussolini. B, Al Capone. C, Phil Spector. Or D, Jeffrey Dahmer. Somebody who opened up a soup I kitchen for the poor. I want to say Al Capone. That seems like a very time timely thing. That and he he gave back to the community when it wasn't bullets. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I was thinking Mussolini. Oh Mussolini. I, well, it was I. I was thinking to Mussolini help the Italian Cap people. Capone. Well, whoever you want, buddy. Uh, Al Capone. Al Capone. Correct. It yes. is wow. Al Alfonso 
Alphonse Capone? I don't know Alfonso his full name. Alfonso Rivera Capone. <laughs> Inventor of the Carlton. He's doing the Carlton while he's serving soup. <laughs> Just getting soup all over the place. They're like, lights out, Capone. And he's like dancing in his cell in Alcatraz. Like, Do you like my pastel sweater and my sweet moves? <laughs> I need some more carrots for this base. <laughs> yeah, that a huge vat, a cauldron Fucking he's stirring. Look, look, Lucky Luciano's rue has nothing on mine. <laughs> Question three. This person instituted a public anti-smoking ban. A. Adolf Hitler. B. Saddam Hussein. C. Muammar Gaddafi. D. Ivan the Terrible. I want to say it's Saddam Hussein or Gaddafi. Saddam Hussein is what I thought of. Saddam Hussein? Yeah, Saddam Hussein. We're going to say Saddam Hussein. Hitler. Hitler. Really? It was Hitler. And Hummels. No smoking outside and no Hummels. And no Hummels. That makes sense. (laughs) Jump back to a previous episode, folks. You'll see what we're talking about. If you want to know what's going on, uh, catch in. (laughs) Catch up with (laughs) Rob and Ray. Go back to the Hummels episode. (laughs) Yep. It's all about the Easter eggs. (laughs) This person has written operas that are still performed today. Mao Zedong, Leonid Brezhnev, Joseph Stalin, Kim Jong-il. I'm going to guess Kim Jong-il. Because I feel like that would be, they would. I mean, he. It was, I'm guessing they were ghost written. <laughs> but um, <laughs> oh god, uh, please, North Korea, yeah. just understand. Ray is the only person who made that comment. <laughs> when does this come out, in North Korea? By the way, <laughs> this podcast <laughs> three thousand twelve. Oh, great. Okay. Look, it's ghost written by a North Korean. So <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Well, you That's are true. correct, Kim Jong Il. Oh, thank yeah. God. Big okay. opera fan. Wrote operas. Wrote books on operas. Big. He actually wrote the Dennis Rodman opera. Right. Exactly. And you know what? The problem is you can't tell them they're bad. Yeah. You have to perform. No, like, absolutely You can't not. tell his son that they're bad. Like, you can't say no. Supreme Leader, would you like to kill these five thousand people now? Mm, maybe after La Traviata. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to stay in the zone. I just want to stay in the zone. I'm feeling the flow, and we're coming up on Act Four, so I'm I'm really almost in. <laughs> the final one. This person was the director of the Human Rights Commission in Indianapolis. A. Jim Jones. B. David Koresh. C. Dr. Jack Kevorkian. D. David Berkowitz. I don't think Berkowitz ever left that, left that burrow. No, the dog wouldn't let he him. He had a, a shot collar on the, him. The dog said, stop gentrifying. <laughs> <laughs> the dog gave real estate advice. <laughs> Besides killing, what else did the dog tell you? Invest in Bensonhurst. Nothing now, but in 10 years, co-ops like you wouldn't believe. Oh, and kill blonde women. Also, he gave me a great idea for a show about a high school chemistry teacher <laughs> who gets cancer, decides to cook crystal math. I just never did anything with it. <laughs> oh, man. I'm going to say Jack Kevorkian. I was thinking him or Koresh. Well, whoever you want. It's your call. We'll go with Kevorkian. That's Jim Jones. Oh, Jim Jones. Jim Jones. the director of the Human Rights Commission in Indianapolis. Yeah. Oh, wow. Sponsored by Kool-Aid. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Just one cup's never oh. enough. <laughs> oh yeah it's pretty, oh you know <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine kool-aid celebrating guys you'll never believe this we finally got a deal in guyana they just bought sixteen thousand cases of co- oh god how are we gonna get it down there who cares oh, who cares this is our biggest sell of the year oh my god <laughs> It's just the Kool-Aid man, like, busting his head against the wall. That's how he breaks it in. <laughs> no, 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 no. Then, yeah. His thing is shattering, like, crack is shattering. <laughs> yeah. his, his pitcher. They just find, like, a half-broken wall with a shattered pitcher and just all oh this Kool-Aid on the ground out back. Well, you two boys, you got uh, two out of five, so... So we're not horrible people. I th- you're not horrible people, but you got to keep an eye out, because there's yeah. horrible people out yeah. there. We're too trusting. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, we you're trust too trusting. way too then, easily. There's terrible trust. people out there who are doing one good thing thing and then completely going back to their shitty ways so just be careful ah, i mean that's the thing jim jones did run an hrc in indianapolis i mean you gotta think about the positive you have to learn to forgive <laughs> <laughs> that's how i look at it mark thanks so much for another Thank fantastic you, game once again folks if you remember the jerry lewis day telethon Hit us up with your memories. If there's some clips that we forgot to mention that you fell in love with, let us know. Tell us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Enjoy your Labor Day. Stay safe. Stay hydrated. When you walk. No, no, no more. I can't take it anymore. On that note, happy Labor Day. Happy Labor Day.
Thanks for listening to This Was a Thing, and a big thanks to the folks that keep this show running. Our editor, Daniel Cut Cut Schwartzberg, our composer, Billy Better Than DC Reese, our social media director, Gabe Hashtag Crawford, our graphic designer, Natalie's Nothing Too Graphic DeSavia, and finally, our games coordinator, Mark the Shark Schroeder. If you liked what we did today, make sure to head on over to iTunes to rate and review us. The more stars you leave us, the more love we feel. Hey, speaking of love, show us some social media love. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at This Was a Thing Pod and Facebook we are This Was a Thing Podcast. Reach out, we'd love to hear from you. And if you really liked what we did today, head on over to Patreon.com and become one of our sponsors, and you'll get access to special episodes, interviews, and merch. That's Patreon. Search This Was a Thing and support us so we can keep doing this show. 